Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. In recent years, and especially with the Middle East conflict, there's been growing tension about what constitutes free speech. What are the limits to free speech? And joining me to discuss free speech in the First Amendment is nationally recognized trial lawyer John Fishwick. Mr. Fishwick is a former United States attorney for the Western District of Virginia and frequent legal expert guest on MSNBC, CNN, Fox Business News, and several shows on the POTUS channel, and now regular expert on News Nation Live. He is attorney and owner of Fishwick Associates. And John, thanks so much for joining the conversation. Bob, thanks so much for having me on your show. Oh gosh, it's an honor and a privilege. Thank you so much. Well, before we get to some various examples, I know that there are certain parameters or what have you when people think about free speech, speech versus something. I'm gonna start with the category of speech versus conduct. What kind of distinctions are in that arena? So Bob, the First Amendment, which was passed in 1791, was designed to promote the marketplace of ideas in this country where government would not interfere with a citizen's right to speech. The government might disagree with what someone said uh, about taxes or about the government or about the president, but they couldn't punish them for that. They couldn't make it a crime. Uh, and so that's why the First Amendment was passed. Now, there are a number of <laughs> exceptions to that, Bob, which I know we're going to discuss today. Uh, particularly that you can't threaten someone, uh, you can't defame someone, say something false about something. The government can also put regulations on the time and place of when speech takes place. But in answer to your question about conduct, uh, there's probably a little less protection for conduct than there is for speech, but the courts, the Supreme Court, which is really the ultimate decider of all these cases, which is kind of a, uh, the, most, the last and most important court, they look at conduct as accompanied with speech, and they say, yes, conduct with speech can have the same protection, but conduct can rise to such a level that it might not be purely speech, and there might be less protection for that. And so, for example, a couple of examples, if I stand up and, 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 and start uh, um, disrupting a speaker, then the conduct, the speech, may, what I say may be all right, but it's the conduct of interruption, right? Correct, Bob. And so particularly, we, we've seen that, you know, our country is getting more animated about different issues and there's more acrimony out there. And we've noticed it in the last year, particularly in our classrooms in this country at certain colleges. Uh, and so you have a right, a First Amendment right, to say wear an armband when you go to class and to protest, say, uh, what's happening in the Middle East or what's happening in another part of this country. But you don't have the right to interrupt a class. You know, the, uh, particularly a state school or even a private school can set certain rules. Uh, and so, yes, you have a free speech right, but you don't have a right to kind of take over a classroom and say the things that you want to say. The, the government is entitled to say, look, when we're in a teaching setting, uh, we can lay down rules and you've got to follow those rules. Yes, you have First Amendment rights. Uh, you need to exercise those out on the common, uh, you know, in a time and place that's agreed upon, but you can't interrupt people, particularly in a classroom setting. You can interrupt somebody. I can interrupt you today. You can interrupt me. We can do that when we're in the town square. But when we're in a classroom, we can't interrupt each other, and that's happening more and more in this country. I think presidents of colleges are wrestling with those issues. I'm not sure they've done such a good job so far, uh, but that I think it's going to be a, a big, big issue over the next several years, Bob. And same in this same category, from a nonverbal, me tearing down a poster of Israeli hostages. It's nonverbal. Is that a speech act or? So, Bob, the person who tears it down would say, yes, I'm exercising my First Amendment rights to disagree with what's on that poster. What the, the government would say and what a prosecutor would say is, well, but that's a threatening act that you've done there. That conduct or, or maybe you say that speech, that's a threatening act and you can't do that. That's criminal. Uh, so you can't tear down a poster. It may be your genuine belief. You can speak out about that. Our country permits you to do that, but you're not allowed to destroy property. The First Amendment doesn't give you immunity from that. So if you go up and tear down a poster because you're angry about it, an Israeli poster or some such thing like that, Bob, that's going to be a crime. That's not going to be protected by the First Amendment. And now another kind of category and distinction is speech versus context. Um, and I guess that's the classic example, perhaps, of yelling fire in a theater. Yeah. It's not the speech, but the context itself um, that is problematic. That's right. So, Bob, you're going back to Oliver Wendell Holmes at the turn of the, uh, the 1900s, who, who 
has that great quote that you can't be in a theater and yell, there's a fire when there's no fire. And so yes, you have a free speech right to say certain words, but if you say those words and they threaten someone, in, in the case of Mr. S Justice Holmes, you'd be threatening the other uh, theater goers or movie goers by saying there's a fire when there's not. If I say to you, I'm going to harm you, I'm going to hit you, yes, I'm using my speech, but if I'm threatening you, and in the case of Justice Holmes, you're threatening the other moviegoers, you can't do that. Yes, you, you, you have free speech rights in this country, but if you're going to threaten someone uh, with what you say or by the, your actions that you take accompanied with your words, that's going to be a crime and not protected by the First Amendment. And another category that is perhaps the most difficult in my mind that we look at, speech versus content. And because a lot of times the content may make me uncomfortable yeah. and where you find that sweet spot. Um, and that's where, for example, a group chanting and chanting in terms of from river to the sea, but well, it may make me uncomfortable, but in and of itself, that's probably permissible. That's right. Governments get in trouble in the First Amendment, Bob, when they start regulating what people can say specifically. In other words, if Congress passed a law that said you can't say from the river to the sea, um, that would be problematic under the First Amendment. The First Amendment says we're going to have this marketplace of ideas. We may be repulsed by it. We may really disagree with it. We may hate the person for what they've said. Uh, it, it, would, it probably is something that we would never say, but nonetheless, Statements like that from the river to the sea, if someone is just chanting that, it would be repulsive, particularly to folks of Jewish faith, and I understand that completely, but probably most courts would say, if they're doing that in a lawful way, they can say that. And you know, one thing that started kind of in the 80s um, was this notion of hate speech, yeah. hate speech. Uh, and in my discipline, in terms of communication, I was one of the minority voices at the time that was saying, now be careful here because what is hate speech? When does it become hate speech? And I saw it used to silence people. Talk a little bit about that ambiguity of what, is there such a thing as hate speech per se? I think there is, Bob. And it obviously it would be repulsive to most folks, to you and me, when we hear folks use certain ways, certain terms when they're derogatory about certain religions or about somebody's race and color. Uh, that, you know, is very repulsive to me and to most citizens. But nonetheless, under the First Amendment, to have a real First Amendment, you have to let people have that freedom to say those things. Where governments, again, get in trouble where if they try to dictate what you can and cannot say, I think the Supreme Court has said, that's kind of a slippery slope. That's kind of a road. Once you go down that road, if you say one word you can say and another word you can't say, uh, that's a slippery slope. So as repulsive as these hate speech is, Unless somebody is threatening when they say that word, if they say a bad word and they're threatening when they do it, unless they're threatening, they're free to say those words. And that's what the First Amendment protects. It protects the most, you know, gosh awful things that people can say as long as it's not threatening. And there's a notion of fighting words. Mm -hmm. Is that a legal kind of distinction? Yeah, th that is, Bob. And so that gets into kind of a, the line that the Supreme Court has to draw. Is it, are you just saying something, you know, we want to go do something or we're against the war, we're against what's happening in the Middle East, you know, we're for the, we're for so-and-so, we're for such-and-such -such a group. You can probably say those things if though accompanied with that is some sort of threat that I'm going to, because you support so-and-so, I'm going to do something to you. I'm going to harm you. I'm going to hit you. I'm going to assault you. Uh, then you've gone too far. First Amendment doesn't protect you, and that's going to be, you know, you can be prosecuted in those situations. Those are, the, the lines on those are not always crystal clear. After all, we're talking about the United States Supreme Court. They write decisions that are very lengthy with lots of concurring opinions and with dissenting opinions. And they take a lot of these cases, Bob. That's where the rubber hits the road, these Supreme Court cases. Other judges have to interpret that. Other citizens have to interpret it. But the, the examples you're giving are right where the lines are drawn. It's not always crystal clear. And as we've seen from this United States Supreme Court, uh, they're, they're willing to reverse decisions that have taken place before. Uh, and so it's going to be interesting to see in the coming years. The First Amendment will always be where there's a lot of lawsuits, a lot of litigation. And although the Supreme Court does not take a lot of cases, they take a fair number in this area. And of course, we have the normal rules about profanity, libel, slander, 
right. obscenity and those things. And so that's right. And so you know you can't you can't defame somebody. So yes, you have a First Amendment right, but you can't say something intentionally false about your fellow citizen and damage their reputation. So the First Amendment does not protect that. It doesn't protect obscenity. In other words, if you're doing something in the pornography area that's viewed as obscene, the First Amendment under certain circumstances doesn't give you protections there. So those sorts of things are not protected by the First Amendment. You know, folks raise those when they get charged criminally with doing something like that or, or when they've been sued for defamation, they say I have a First Amendment right. But the courts have been, been pretty clear in both the obscenity and the defamation area uh, where you say something false about somebody that the First Amendment does not protect you. And well, are there some major distinctions, I'm assuming, between public and private property? Yeah, there is, Bob. That's a great question. So. You know, private schools often can say, well, we're private, so, you know, we can make whatever rules we want. We're not bound by these Supreme Court precedents. The, the First Amendment applies to governments. We're not a government. We're a private school. We're a private entity. We're a private business. That First Amendment only applies to governments, you know, and it, and it does apply to all governments, not just the federal government, state and local. But private entities often say, hey, look, we're not bound by the First Amendment. We're going to clamp down on everybody. We're going to have specific things you can't say, for example, on our campus. Whereas public entities, they are completely bound by the First Amendment. They can't infringe a, a school, a judge, or a, a government, a local or state or federal government. They can't infringe on our First Amendment rights. They can't, they can't say, we're going to start regulating what you can say. They have to follow the Supreme Court precedents, the law of the land, which is not, like I've said, it's not always crystal clear, but there are at least certain things that we've talked about today that I think most folks accept that that's the law of the land. You know, it seems like a lot of controversy in terms of uh, universities, it's kind of a special. And it seems like, my view, um, it seems like universities and colleges are more tolerant of some class disruptions or faculty uh, creating a hostile uh, educational environment. Um, what's interesting about that is um, there's a, a, a council of presidents in Virginia that all the university presidents belong to and the governor meets with them. And he said, I want you all to focus on your code of conduct in five areas. One is disruptions of school functions, violations of federal, state, local laws and ordinances, unlawful masking, I wanna come back to that one, uh, erection of encampments, and facility usage by affiliated to non-affiliated persons or groups. It seems like and he actually recently had a meeting where each president had to stand up and to actually provide specifics in terms of the altering of the um, code of conduct. That's kind of an interesting way to handle this issue, isn't it? Because the more they can put, okay, in this situation, these are our expectations, and it makes it about the school and conduct and might not make it quite as legal. What's your thoughts about that strategy? Yeah, that's a great point, Bob. So, I, you know, codes of conduct, I think, are going to be a thing in the future in schools, in both our colleges and our high schools and our middle schools and our elementary school. It makes good sense. What I think Governor is, Youngkin is trying to set out there, these are going to be the guidelines for students. So if you do certain things, in other words, if you take over a classroom and have a sit-in, uh, if you cover up your, your, mat, your face with a mask, or if you camp out, if you disrupt classes, a code of conduct is designed to prevent that. Um, and so there's really not going to be, I think, a First Amendment right to say, hey, look, we have a right to camp out in your class and say what we want, you know, about the Middle East tomorrow. We're going to disrupt the history class and we're going to just uh, have chance the whole 50 minutes of the class. I don't think you have a First Amendment right to do that. So I think codes of conduct are good because it's out there for all the students and the faculty to see and, and maybe the faculty needs to know it too. Uh, so that I think the the, the key thing that you're doing there, whether it's in the state of Virginia or the state of California or New York, you're trying to have some uniformity here. I think the challenges that the presidents faced this past year, it was my impression that there were really different rules that applied to different schools. Some schools were really cracking down on folks and having them arrested. Some, some schools were saying, well, yeah, you took over our school, but we're going to forgive everything. No, nothing happens to you. And so I think there's been inconsistent punishment for folks. I think there need, need to be real rules that need to be set out. The first 
First Amendment should not protect students who are disrupting the school, who are taking away not just their educational opportunities, but educational opportunities for other students uh, who are going there who are not participating. So it's really a selfish move when you kind of take over a classroom for something that you want to say that's got nothing to do with the classroom. So I think codes of conduct are going to be found to be legal. I think the Supreme Court will, will, will find that they're legal. Yes, you could go too far. When, if it gets too much based on the exact things that you say, and prohibit students from doing that, that might run afoul of the Supreme Court. But if you just set standards on interruption and when you protest, uh, I think they'll be upheld by the Supreme Court. Well, the one that was surprising I said I'd come back to is this unlawful masking, um, ski mask or whatever. That's, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like that, that gets one of those like, wow, I don't know, in terms of interpretation. Yeah. Even though we know they're trying to protect their identity so they yeah. wouldn't get arrested. That, that's one that I thought was interesting. It is, Bob. And so some of the students may say, well, that's my religious garb that I'm wearing. You know, you're infringing on my religious freedoms there. Some may say this is connected to COVID. I mean, who knows what they'll say. Uh, so that may be, I think when you start getting into dress and those sorts of things, you run a risk of running afoul of the Constitution. Maybe not the right to free speech, but maybe a religious right. You do have to be sensitive to that, obviously. I think what you want to prevent is interruption and disruption of the school and the classroom. You don't want to go so far that you're trying to prevent folks who are lawfully protesting something and speaking out about something. They should have an avenue to do that. Well, you know, it's interesting. The Knight Foundation uh, just this year did a um, uh, research and polling among college students. It was fascinating. It's a very different group now. 70% of the students say that speech is as damaging as physical violence. Yeah. Sixty six percent said, yes, I very much have to self censor in my classes and in my environment. Fifty percent of the students say, my goodness, free speech is declining. And so there's interesting difference in perceptions of what's tolerant and then saying, oh, my gosh, words can hurt. Yeah. Absolutely, Bob, and I think we've really, you've put your finger right on the pulse of that with, the, with our schools and our universities, particularly with the, the disputes over what's happening in the Middle East. It's something that's being said that really harms somebody of Jewish faith uh, versus somebody who, who's taking the, the side of the Palestinians and those sorts of disputes. Different words are being said, and the college has got the obligation to protect everyone, so they can't let anyone go too far and harm folks. The big thing that the colleges are worried about, Bob, as you know, is funding. You know, if, if they're harming students and taking it, infringing on a student's religious rights or religious freedoms, uh, the government can say, hey, look, we gave you $10 million last year for your school, but because you have not protected folks' religious rights, we're taking that funding away. I think some of the colleges have been so afraid of that that they haven't really stepped in to protect students. They've been, they've kind of let it be laissez-faire and let things go. They've been too afraid to protect students. I think they do need to step in there. Real harm is being done with words. And, and, and sometimes these words can be threats, you know, and, and if it's an unspoken threat or a spoken threat. And the Supreme Court has said, you know, you can't use words to threaten someone. So there are, there are ways for colleges to step in and protect folks from these harmful things. Hopefully you're, we're going to see more of that because I think this past year or past two years, uh, my overall grade that I'd give to university presidents is not so good. I, they're probably a C or a D. Yes, and, um, and, and, and wow, what a tough tough environment and job it is this area I'm afraid that I would be a little bit on the on the harder side yeah. um, we're going to talk a little bit about the public versus private organizations um, I'm kicked off a platform mm -hmm. YouTube doesn't like and, 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 and censoring and removing material how do you sort the free speech issue there when you've got subjective or private versus these private organizations censoring and kicking off. What, what, what's your perspective there? Yeah, so Bob, that's really a cutting edge of the area of the law right now with the Supreme Court. They had a couple of cases this term dealing with that. The interesting thing that the Supreme Court seems to be doing is they're saying the Facebooks, the Twitters of the world, they have certain First Amendment rights. They have editorial rights. And they seem to be saying, at least as of now, that they have the right 
to decide who can be on their platforms and not be on their platforms. If they can decide if somebody's saying something hateful or completely erroneous and not based in fact, the Supreme Court seems to be stepping away from saying that they can't do that. They're letting them do that. What they are saying is when states have regulations, when a state legislature passes a law that says, hey, Facebook, you can't take a conservative person or a liberal person off your platform. You don't have that right. What the Supreme Court, I think surprisingly, is saying so far is yes, those platforms do have First Amendment rights. They have editorial rights in the private setting. Supreme Court hadn't gone all the way on those cases, but so far they seem to be favoring that the Facebooks of the world, the Twitters of the world, these companies do have certain First Amendment rights and they can do certain regulations, certain editorializing of their platforms. And it seems like some of the platforms contribute to this echo chamber kind of thing, not yeah. unlike we see on the cable and some of the news outlets, right? Because That's right. If their editorial decisions of including or not including can favor one side or the other. Absolutely, Bob. I mean, we see that. I mean, we, everybody seems to go to their side, whether they're red or blue, and they're, they have the various uh, press and social media that are associated with their side. Um, and so, and then the side, if you're on the other side, you want to make sure that they're not taking down your folks on their platform. But I think what the Supreme Court is saying is that the private entities, these, these social media companies, have the rights to do that. And I think that's probably surprising to most folks. I think most legislators think they can regulate those companies and tell them that they have to keep everybody up on their platforms. So far, the Supreme Court is saying, no, these, these, these social media companies, they have First Amendment rights too, and we're going to honor those. You know, today with our polarized society and what have you, and what about the workplace? How does free speech operate in the workplace? I know for a while we were discouraged as a state employee, um, going back a decade or so, to not have any holiday or Christmas kind of things in the office. Um, you need to be cautious about what's on your desk. How does the workplace environment, who's dominant there in terms of the rights of speech and expression? So, Bob, that's a great question. I think most of the time the courts are going to say, and even the Supreme Court is going to say, that the employer has a lot to do there. In other words, you can't, you can't make such a political statement in a, certainly a private job that interferes with the workplace. And in a public job, let's say you're in a state school, you work in a state school or state government, you can, yes, you can have a political statement, but you can't interfere with the workplace. And so what the employer will always say, uh, if they fired somebody or demoted somebody, that you were doing this so much, it was you weren't doing your job. In other words, you were so intent on, on, on saying your piece about something that has nothing to do with the work that we were forced to terminate you. But you do have certain First Amendment rights in a, in a public job, uh, but nonetheless, you can't interfere with the work. And so that's, that's where the line will be drawn. Are you allowed to say something or wear a band or a button? I think all that's free in a, in a public job, but it, it can't be such of a level that you're not doing your work. And when we think about technology today, and free speech and artificial intelligence. I mean, how, how are you kind of viewing that? Because ownership, creativity, but it may be missed in front. I mean, in other words, how in the world are you thinking about that arena in terms of technology yeah. and free speech and AI today? Yeah, so Bob, that's a great question. And you know, the law is slow to catch up to technology. You know, we've, so we're talking about cases from, you know, 1919 today and, and maybe 20 years ago. And so those cases will have to apply to AI, you know, and make decisions based on that. The things that we've been talking about, the, the guidelines that we've been talking about will apply to AI. But how do people figure that out? What's happening there? They'll have to follow what the law is. The law doesn't say we're making new law. We're making law based on our previous decisions. We look back in the law. What, what, what did another judge say and then how does that apply to this case? So the law is not as well equipped for all these changes as it probably should be, but nonetheless the law is not going to change. It will still look back to decide how to decide a case that's in front of it and it'll be a challenge. And I guess it's better, I mean there is a role for law yeah. and I guess going forward it'd be in the, within the legislatures and, and, and things like that to try to be proactive rather than reactive. But the clock is ticking, of course. 
Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's the, the legislature, I think, can take more action there to try to protect people's rights. But, you know, they ultimately Supreme Court will decide if they pass some law that the Supreme Court says violated the First Amendment, then the, the legislature will have to start all over. And so ultimately, the Supreme Court is going to be the arbiter of these decisions. It takes a long time for a case to get to the Supreme Court, maybe four or five years sometimes. Not every case makes it to the Supreme Court. Uh, so it's going to be interesting times with, as you talk about, all this cutting edge technology with AI. It's, uh, it's going to be the wild west out there and how does the law deal with that uh, you know I'm not sure the, uh, that my profession is set up as best it could for that but they'll just have to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis and you know another over the past couple of years a lot of controversy and state lawmakers introducing legislation related to books in schools yeah. and I don't know if that's so much about free speech as it is about censorship and ideas but that's another one of those areas um, that seem to be clashing. It seems to be clashing in a big way, Bob. And they're not easy lines of decision there with books. You know, I think books where a, where a legislature can say they've got some sort of sexual purian interest or something like that, or or it's just wrong, it's false. You know, the 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 academic side of it is false or wrong. They, they maybe have a, a basis to step in and pass a law. But I do think, you know, when you start to see kind of classic books uh, being, you know, kicked out of, of libraries and of schools, that's probably not a healthy thing. One of the tests I've always talked about, Bob, is say, look, if somebody wants to keep a book out of a library, we'll give them a test. If they've read the book and they can pass the test, we'll take the book out of the library. But instead of just going by what 30 other people said on the internet about a book, actually read the book, and articulate why it should be not read, to students should not read it, and be able to pass a test about the book. If you do all that and, and you can pass that test, let the book come out of the library. But I think there's a lot of hysteria in this area, uh, and, and some of it is good. Some books should not be in classrooms, should not be in libraries, obviously, uh, but some books should, and so these are gonna be tough decisions for judges. You know, we're down to a final minute or so, and I just wanna give you an opportunity. Your final thought, your key takeaway, as it relates to the struggle in terms of free speech, what would you say is a closing thought? Well, obviously it's our First Amendment, Bob. It's the First Amendment to, the, to our civil rights laws, and, and many would say it's our most important one. It's what separates us from China, from Russia, that everybody in this country has can share in ideas, can disagree with each other, we can laugh at the other person's idea, we can criticize ideas, they can criticize my ideas, your ideas, and that's a wonderful thing. It is being tested in our country today. People are, sometimes are hateful and are threatening and are doing things and saying things that they shouldn't do. And the First Amendment does not and should not protect that. And so it's, we live in an acrimonious time. We're gonna continue to see these sorts of showdowns between the First Amendment and people's, what they think are their rights, and sometimes they're infringing on other folks' rights. And our court system and our citizens are gonna have to deal with that. The ultimate arbiter is gonna be the Supreme Court it's an interesting time to live. Absolutely. My goodness, John, thank you so much for being my guest today. This was very interesting and fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. And as always, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.